If you have a Bible, uh, meet me in James chapter 5. It's been two months since the last time we were in this book, and so I know you remember everything that I say, but I do want to try and put your mind into remembrance of what we've been talking about. James is um, an epistle. Epistle is a letter, and James is the author of the book of James, and the interesting thing about James is that he is the brother of Jesus. And at first, he did not believe that his brother was the Messiah, was a savior, which makes a lot of sense. If your sibling came to you and said, I'm God, you would say, no, you're not. (laughs) He said, I am. So what would it take for you to believe that your sibling was God? They probably would have to rise from the dead. Well, that's exactly what happened. Jesus dies. He raises from the, rises from the dead, and he appears to 500. He appears to Peter, and then the 12. And then it says that he appeared to James. And after he appeared to James, James became a believer. He became the leader of the church in Jerusalem and was known as James the Just. He was a, a man that was revered all throughout Jerusalem as the first pastor there in Jerusalem and was just a a man after God's own heart who loved his brother and worshiped him as God. And he writes this letter. This letter is addressed to the Jewish Christians who have been spread out due to persecution. And so they're all over the region due to persecution. And he writes this letter, not so much to give them theology. It's not a book of theology. The book of James is actually more about practical living. He doesn't talk about a lot of doctrine. He only mentions Jesus twice in his book. It's more of a book about, yes, you have knowledge, but I want your conduct to now go alongside with what you say you believe. And so this is what James is doing. It's an intensely practical book, and he's hoping you Christian, you say you're a Christian, your faith needs to be in motion, not just staying in one place. When we were kids, my dad every Thursday would take us to Chuck E. Cheese or take us to Scandia, and we always looked forward to that because we knew we're going to have games, we're going to get those nachos, we're going to have those ices. We always look forward to it. And at Chuck E. Cheese or Scania, there were these little rides. I don't know if you remember these. You put up your kids in them, and they just kind of move forward or backward, or they go up or down, or maybe they go around. James would say, I don't want your faith to be like that. Just having motion, motion here and there, but no progress. I put my youngest daughter in there a couple of days ago at Chuck E. Cheese, and she said, get me out. <laughs> She did not enjoy being in that car. And I don't think James would want us to be, have that kind of faith, to be only going just a little bit here and there. I want to see progress in your life. So he's been talking about real faith. If you have real faith, you have the, the, the mind to ask God for wisdom in trials. If you have real faith, then you watch what you say with your tongue. If you have real faith, you care about widows and orphans. If you have real faith, you don't show favoritism. If you have real faith, you ask God to come into your plans. And today, James is going to say something else about if you truly have faith, then you should do this very thing, or you should not do this very thing. And it's very important because if you miss this, you might not go to heaven. So you should listen. James chapter 5, and pick me up in verse 1. Hear the words of the living and true God. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not 
opposing you. I want to label today's message hoarders. Hoarders. If you come to my house on a night of the week, you are likely to find my wife sitting on the floor folding clothes and watching one of two things on the television, either intervention or hoarders. Now, I've never sat down to watch hoarders, but you know how it is. Your wife is watching something, and you see it, and you just get sucked into what you're seeing. And every time I watch the show Hoarders, if you've never seen it, it's this show that documents people who have this issue or disorder of hoarding things in their homes or their trailer home. And it's really bad. The rooms are filled to the top with stuff. Sometimes you can't even go into a room because it's so filled. And it's not good stuff. It's garbage, basically. Sometimes the freezer might be full of cats. I mean, it's disgusting. And obviously, one of the things you learn in the show is that often it's a... A a trauma that happens in somebody's life that brings that on. Somebody dies, they go through something, and it triggers this thing of hoarding. Now, it's hard for me because I'm watching and I'm watching with judgment saying, how could you let your house get that bad? I, I, your, your dishes can be okay, your room. I understand a little bit of mess. I'm a generally messy person. But to get that bad... Oh, man, that's just, that's just a little bit too much. And it's a symptom of something that's actually a lot more serious. I think if James were to look at us and he says, you, and he's speaking to a particular people, if this is the way that you live life, that you hoard things, it's actually a symptom of something that's a lot more serious. And you who are listening today, it's very important that you hear the message that James gives to us in this text. Now, before we jump in and really get into it, there are a couple hurdles that we have to jump over to get to the meaning of this text. Now, here's the first hurdle we have to jump over, and that is, who is it written to? Who is he talking to? Who is it written to? Now, you say, well, that's obvious. If you look at verse 1, he says, now, listen, you rich people. So that's very obvious who he's talking about, right? Well, One of the things that you see, and this is one of the more difficult passages in James and in the Bible to interpret, because one of the things scholars and commentators argue about is, well, is he talking to Christians or is he talking to non-Christians? And the reason that there are some who would say he's talking to non-Christians is because, as we just read, if you notice, he said nothing to them about being brothers or sisters. In the book of James, you notice he uses this Greek word, that is translated brethren or brothers and sisters. In these six verses, he never says brothers. And so they say he must be speaking to those outside of the faith. Here's the second reason why they would say he's not speaking to Christians. They would say because usually when he's laying into the people, he usually gives them an encouragement or shows them a way to repent or encourages them in some way. You see none of that in this. He just comes to them and says, you rich people, and he starts to say, weep and wail. This is coming upon you. You're going to be a lamb led to the slaughter. I mean, there's nothing in there that seems encouraging. And so it has made commentators and scholars say he must be writing to non-Christians who are rich. Problem with that is why would James be talking to someone who's not there? This is a book that's written to who? Jewish Christians. Why in the world would he start talking out of nowhere to unbelievers? Now, we know unbelievers can be in the services, but for the entire time, he's been speaking to brothers, to brethren, to brothers and sisters. All of a sudden, he says, now I want to address unbelievers, to people who are not there. It doesn't make much sense at all. So who exactly is he talking to? One thing John Calvin says is that one of the things that he thinks James is doing is he is maybe speaking about or to unbelievers, knowing they're not there, but knowing there are Christians there who are probably majority, all poor, who would hear this is what's going to happen to those who hoard riches, that there's going to be a judgment. And if you are thinking, I wish I had all that, I wish I was in their position, he would say, no, you don't. Listen to what's going to happen. Listen to the judgment that is coming upon them. And so maybe what he's doing is he's saying, hey, don't be like them. There's judgment coming. And he's trying to help them see, don't put your trust in riches because they're fading. So whether or not you believe he's talking to unbelievers, I think either way, James knows there are Christians who are hearing this who might be envying people who have a lot of money. 
and says, listen, this is not going to end well for them. That's the first hurdle who's written to. Here's the second hurdle, and, and that is to say, well, wealth and riches must be bad then. Because this is what he says is happening to people who have riches. Therefore, it must be bad. Wealth is bad. People who have money are evil. No, because wealth comes from God. God gives you money. God, in the Bible, we know people who were rich. Abraham, Job, Solomon, they all were given wealth by God. The other reason I know that wealth isn't bad is because God is rich. What's God's net worth? He owns, I don't know, everything? So if wealth was bad, then God would be in sin. Wealth is not bad. It's what you do with wealth is the issue. So wealth is not bad. It's not bad at all. Here's the, here's the, the third hurdle that we have to jump over, and that is you will hear this message written to Christians about wealth and riches, but you'll say, but I'm not rich. Therefore, this does not apply to me. Here's the problem. You are rich. Now, let me show you, and there's just a few things to show you. We are rich if you look at, number one, our bank accounts. Now, if you, the problem is if you compare yourself to Jeff Bezos and to uh, you know, your, the millionaire that you know or the people who live in Tiburon, you might say, well, yeah, those people, they're rich because compared to what I make, they make more, much more than me. But the, the problem is you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Amen. Did you know if you make $37,000, if you make more than $37,000, you are in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. In the world. Now, we always think locally when we think about riches, but we need to start thinking globally. If you make more than $37,000, you are in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. In the eyes of the world, we are rich. Bill Gates went to a city in a third world country, and he went into this hut to talk to this lady about health care and things that they could do to try and make it better for them. And he was speaking to her through a translator. And after he left, the translator asked the woman, said, did you know you are in the presence of the richest man in the world? And she said, everybody who comes from the West is rich. I don't see any difference between him and anybody else. I read this and this blew me away. You'll see it on the screen. It says, financially speaking, the difference between you and Bill Gates is smaller than the difference between you and the average person living outside the U.S. If you think about the number of people who are living on less than $2 a day, the World Bank's international poverty line is at $1.90. The number of people living on less than $2 a day, 700 million. So if you were to look at our bank accounts, it would reveal that we are rich. Here's the second thing to look at, our bodies. 41.9% of Americans have obesity. Now how do you get obesity? When you eat more calories than you burn. And in this day, we consume so much, and we're moving less than we ever have. A lot of our jobs are sitting, and so we're eating more calories than we ever have, moving less than we ever have, and so we're heavier than we've ever been. And usually, you remember back in the day, the, the fat cats? That's a way of speaking about somebody who has wealth, who has a bunch of money. And we have food all around us. You think back in the day, you could just say, ah, I don't feel like cooking. I'm going to go down to In-N-Out. Couldn't do that. If you drive out of our parking lot and drive for 10 seconds, you will run into a place where you can get something to eat. And then you drive five more seconds, you will find a plaza with stuff to eat. Very easily, very accessible. 
We have regular food, organic food, seafood, fast food, Mexican food, all kinds of food available right to us. So if we look at our bodies, it shows it, that our bodies bear the marks of wealth. Here's the third. Here's the third. Blouse, belts, boots, and button-ups. In other words, what we wear. Just a question. If you take what you have on right now, how much did it cost? Don't tell me. Just what you have on, shoes, clothes, everything you have on. The minimum, I tried to find, track down the minimum. I saw one said that the minimum for a lot of people is $100. We walk into our closets, closets with stuff here, stuff here, shoes up here, walk in. I ain't got nothing to wear. <laughs> we, are, we are rich. Historically, we live in the wealthiest country at the wealthiest time in history. And you, if you're a believer in here, you are the richest Christians in the world. I can show you the statistics from the Gideons and from other missionary, um, um, missionary organizations that talk about the amount of wealth that resides in the United States compared to other places as far as what they give. So I don't want you to get the, the thought this morning, well, this doesn't apply to me, because it does. It applies to all of us. In fact, it applies to us probably more than it ever has because we live, and I always like to say this, in the Disneyland of the world. We have so much at our disposal. So what James is saying to us this morning, he's speaking to each one of us in here, and even though we all don't make the same amount, and even though some of us can be struggling, you are rich. And so this word applies to you. Now, when I was a kid, I don't know if you ever did this, you would put on the jersey of your um, favorite baseball player, basketball player, and when you put it on, you felt like, I'm just like him. I have all his skills, all his abilities. I want to be just like him. My favorite basketball player growing up was Allen Iverson. So I'd put on my Iverson jersey, my Iverson kicks, and I would go outside, practice his, his uh, crossover, his shot, everything. I want to be just like Allen Iverson. I felt, you put that jersey on, I become Allen Iverson. It feels like James has put on his prophet jersey. Because in these six verses, he almost sounds like one of the Old Testament prophets, like Amos and Isaiah, who comes to the people of God and says, listen, you guys have been doing this, you've been doing this, and now there's judgment that's coming because of the way you've been living. And so James comes to us a little bit aggressive this morning to say, you who are rich, I want you to listen to what I am saying. And so there are, if you were to think of this as a court and there are charges being brought, there are three charges that James brings to this court hearing, and they're all against those who are rich. Here's the first one. You have been charged with, number one, hoarding wealth. Hoarding wealth. Look again with me at verse one of James chapter five. He says, now listen, you rich people, Weep and wail. That's all language from the Old Testament that deals with judgment. When God's judgment would come, the people would weep. They would wail. They would cry out because of the misery that is coming on you. Verse 2, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. And here it is. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Hoarded wealth. We said earlier, wealth, riches, money is not evil. The issue he has here is that you have hoarded it. Did you see that? How is it that your wealth has rotted, which probably means something about food, the way you would um, calculate someone's wealth had to do with what you ate, food, what you wore, your clothing, and then precious metals, which is how you had money. That's how you measured wealth in that day. So all those things are corroding. How is it that all that stuff would corrode? The reason it's corroding is because it's not being used. Why does food rot? Because it's not being used. Why are clothes have moths eating through it? Because it's not being used. How is it that gold and silver are corroding? Because it's not being used. And it's interesting because silver and gold don't corrode. 
But he's saying, even you're putting all of your trust in what, at least in, in our terms, says it doesn't corrode, it won't save you. Even silver and gold, it will not be able to protect you. Even that's corroding. How is that? Because you put it up in a barn, in a savings account, in a closet, and locked it up and done nothing with it. That is what is evil. That is what is wrong. Have you ever in your life thrown away food because it spoiled or is rotting? Put bags of salad into the garbage can. It's such an American bougie thing to do, huh? And just throw it away. It's crazy. We throw away food that's been in the freezer. It's in the freezer for eight months, and you look at it, oh, this is expired. That means if you have food that expired, that means you had so many options that you didn't even have time to eat that. That's too much food. How does food rot? Because <laughs> you have too much. You open the refrigerator, I ain't got nothing to eat. It's crazy. It's being hoarded. Listen, wealth is supposed to be used, not hoarded. We buy food all the time. We go to Costco, spend $300, come home, be like, I don't feel like cooking. Let's go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> it's just me? No, it's all of us. <laughs> we walk into our closets. Literally, closets full of stuff. I read in a book called the, the, what was it called? The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Awesome book. But it's about slowing down because Jesus was never in a hurry. So it's really, really good. But one of the things he talks about in his book is trying to simplify his life. And so uh, minimalism, I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's the idea of just, you know, you don't need all this stuff. Simplify your life. So one thing he did in a season, he said, I would only have six outfits. And I would only use, somebody said, oh, <laughs> six <laughs> outfits. <laughs> and you would use, so on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'd have my gray sweatshirt and then on you know, Tuesday and Thursday, I wear this. And so you'd only have six, wash them, and then start again. Now, you balk at that six outfits. Did you know at this time, peasants in this time, workers in this time, they would have one garment. And for us, we, we have so many options. We have stuff in the closet that when I get my body right, I'm going to wear that. <laughs> and it's been in there for a long time. Throw it away. Throw it away. And when you get your body right, buy something new. Why have moths gone into it? Because it's packed up in the back of the closet and nothing is not being used. You know that the storage industry is a $38 billion industry? It is 2.3 billion square feet of storage in the United States. Our clothes have houses. <laughs> there are people, <clears throat> human beings, who don't have a place to live. And your shoes and your lawnmower and your has, has temperature controlled rooms. If this is not saying we are a rich people. Every time, when I was living at the house, it my job to take the garbage out. And I would take the garbage out, and sometimes there'd be so much, I would literally have to stand in the garbage can to get the garbage all the way down. If you take garbage out every, once a week, we all, some of us, take our garbage out to the street. If that doesn't tell you how rich we are, full of stuff that we've thrown away because we've just been consuming. This is, he says, you've hoarded it. You have it stored up. Again, the issue is not that you have it. The issue is that you've hoarded it. And here's another thing. He's not talking about saving, and he's not talking about investing. He's talking about you just having this surplus of stuff that you're not even using to do anything. And it's just stuff that you just have there. Again, you know what he says? He says, your, all this stuff that you've hoarded 
it will testify against you that in the day of the coming of the Lord, when he comes to judge the living and the dead, all the stuff you hoarded will testify against you. I like to call to the stand bag of salad. <laughs> and bag of salad comes to the stand. He says, and, and do you know the defendant? Yes, I do. Tell me about what happened. When, when did they purchase you? They purchased me on June 8th. And then what happened after that? I was thrown in the garbage. After how long? Three weeks. And he would open up the refrigerator and I would see him have Chick-fil-A and he would have Chipotle and he would have BJ's. Who threw you in the garbage? He did. How long were you in the freezer? Or refrigerator? Three weeks. And they will testify all the clothes, all the stuff that you just put up and then never used. And again, the reason why this is so terrible, and as we're going, we'll see how bad it is, is that it could be used to help people. Again, you have so much, and you just waste it. That's the first charge. Here's the second charge. Not just holding or hoarding wealth, but number two, holding back wages. Holding back wages. Look at verse four. He says, look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So the second charge is that you who are rich, you have held back wages. In those days, the wealthy would have um, land and they would hire people to come and work their land. And after the day, they would come and they would ask for their uh, payment for the day. They were day laborers. They don't work for two weeks and then get a check. They needed it immediately, right away. And what these rich landowners were doing, were at the end of the day, they were, the workers would come and say, I'm ready to get my payment for the day, and they would not pay them and send them home. Maybe because they thought, I want them to come back, I need them to work, so they wouldn't pay them. Whatever reason, they did not pay them what they had worked for. And this is very bad, because in that day, you needed to get paid in order to eat. They were, a society was called uh, hand-to-mouth, meaning that you would work, and then what you did that day would, would get what you would eat. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. It wasn't, you, you don't have a refrigerator. You don't have a freezer. You don't have In-N-Out and Habit Burger and Panda Express. You don't have that. And so what these workers would do, they would go, they would say, please pay me. They would say no. And what are you going to do if you're a poor person? You're going to call the police? You're going to call the government? You're going to take them to court? Earlier in the book of James, remember he said, the, the rich are dragging you to court. And extorting, they are paying off judges. So there's no place for if you are poor for you to get any kind of justice. If, the, if you do the work and the, and the, the landowner says, I'm not, I'm not paying you, what are you going to do? The only thing you can do is cry out to God. That's all they could do. That's all they could do. And listen what James says. James says, all, that, all those people that you've been defrauding, God has heard it. Because he says, the cries of the people working in your fields have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Which is so interesting, the words that James uses when he says the Lord Almighty. Kurios Sabaoth. This is translated in the Greek uh, Septuagint, the uh, Greek translation of the, the <clears throat> Old Testament it is translated there, that word is translated the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. We think of God as being this old man on a throne who just can't get up and do anything. We just came pointing at people. That is not. He is the Lord of the armies of heaven. And he has heard the cries of his people. You see it all throughout the, the Old Testament. Look up, when you get time, look up when the people of God cry out to him in times of injustice. It's all over the Bible. The blood of Abel cried out to God. The Israelites, and they're in 
bondage, they cry out to God and God hears and he comes. And so James says, you rich, you wealthy, you people who have been oppressing the poor, judgment is coming. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies is coming to avenge. And so if, if you're poor in that day, all you could do is pray to God. And James is saying, there is coming a time where the ears of the Lord have heard and the Lord is coming. So I want you to hear, this is Deuteronomy, because this, this is not something that they had not heard. This is something God put into the law. Deuteronomy 24, in verse 14 and 15, says, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Leviticus 19 and verse 13, do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. So how does, how does this apply to us? And all? You say, I don't have any employees. I don't have people who work for me. And maybe you do. And if you do, pay them. Amen. And pay them on time. Do you owe anybody any money? Christians sometimes take advantage of the fact that because they know somebody or in their relationship with somebody, they don't have to pay back what they borrowed. I told the story when I was doing the message for Sammy's um, memorial service that my car needed some work. I got stuck. I was at ATN's house and the engine went crazy. And so I was able to get into the house and I called Sammy and said, hey, can you you come help me? So he came, he got the car, he took it, he fixed it, and then brought it back to me. And he said, whenever, whenever you can pay it, it's fine. At the time, the church couldn't pay me, so I was making nothing. And so I was, I was stressed out, but I said, oh, well, he said I can pay him when he could. But I took advantage of that, and I just did not pay back anything. At some point, Sammy had to say, um, Shala, so can we start talking about maybe you getting me that money? And I felt so bad because I had taken advantage of our friendship, the fact that I knew him. We'd be trying to get people to do stuff for Give me the family discount. I know people, I see them talking on social media. God is good. God is doing great things. He's blessing. Lift your hands. Away. And they're like, you owe people money. Pay people back what you owe them. Tip well. Can I tell you, Christians have a bad reputation for tipping. Bad tipping. Now, if you look at the data, the actual research, it's not true that Christians are bad tippers. But because there have been so many stories that have gone viral about Christians who've done that, that's become sort of the narrative. But when we go into a restaurant and waitresses will say, the worst time is the Sunday rush how people come out to church. Because I know they're just going to be asking for a bunch of stuff and then they won't tip me. Don't leave a tract. Amen. <laughs> Talking about may God bless you and keep you and believe the gospel. No. Leave a track and money. In fact, one pastor, I'm not joking, a pastor wrote on the, the receipt. He said, I give God 10%. Why would I give you 18? He's a Christian, a pastor. One group came after, after church. They walked in, looked at the waitress, said, we're not going to pay you. We're not going to tip you. He said, why? He says, the Bible says you're not supposed to work on Sunday. <laughs> and so her manager came, and he took the, the table for her. He said, I'm not going to have her work for free. Pay what you owe. Tip well is one way that we can apply this text. Here's the third charge. A hedonistic way of life. Hedonistic way of life. Hedonism, we talked about this before, is the pursuit of pleasure. And a hedonistic way of life, look at verse 5. Here's the third charge. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. I had fun 
this week thinking about this text because a debate that happens in our family all the time is whether or not or how Christians should think about luxury. How should we think about Luxury. Should Christians buy luxurious things? How much is too much to buy this particular item? So, for example, sometimes there's a purse that costs $5,000. And I want to buy that purse because it's a nice purse. As a Christian, should I be able to buy that? And so we have discussions about this. So I asked, I said, okay, so this $5,000 purse, does it do the same thing as the $15 one from Walmart? (laughs) They carry stuff. He said, yes, it does. Okay, okay, cool. So then why would you pay more? And then they have all their arguments. Why? They say, well, look at the craftsmanship. Look at where it comes from. Look at who made it, right? It was made by the, the Smurfs. They put it together with unicorn hair, and it's really, really durable, and we can use it forever, and it's an investment, and on and on and on. And you can have anything, your watch, shoes, keyboard, cars, houses. How do you think about luxury? Because he says, this judgment is coming on you because you've lived in luxury. So we have to ask the question, should we be living in luxury? Should we be living in this way? The actual word here literally means to live a soft life. You know, you, you say somebody's lived a hard life. This is somebody who lives in luxury. They don't have much to worry about. They're living a soft life. Now, here again is the issue that we need to look at, and that is wealth, money is not the issue. It is how you use it. So is it a problem for you to have nice things to go on vacations? No. But how do you use it? Are you hoarding it? Are you defrauding people? Have you gained your wealth through evil practices? And are you just using it on yourself? When we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, there's only one thing we think about, sexual morality, right? That's the, that's the thing we always think about. But if you actually look in Scripture, that wasn't their only sin. In Uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Listen to what he says about this city. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were, listen, arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. Overfed. They had an abundance, they use it on themselves, and instead of sharing what they had with other people, they use it on just themselves. It should remind you of a story Jesus told. Remember the story he tells about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man, he lived in this great big house. He was dressed in fine linen, purple, which is the the color of royalty, really expensive clothes, and he ate well. Some translations said he ate sumptuously. You know it's good when you eat sumptuously. And outside of his gate, there was a poor man whose name was Lazarus. And he was so poor, the dogs, they come and they would lick his sores. And daily, he wanted, if only I can just eat the crumbs that fell off of his table. And day by day by day, this rich man watched as Lazarus got smaller and smaller and smaller and starved to death while he's eating and stuff is falling off of his table. And one day, the rich man dies and Lazarus dies. The rich man goes to hell and the poor man, Lazarus, he goes to paradise at Abraham's side. Now you hear that story, you would say, He went to hell because he was rich. No, he did not go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he saw a need and decided to ignore it. Living in luxury, living in self-indulgence is an issue when there are people right outside your door who need your help or right in your cell group who need your help. So the question we have to ask that my family talks about all the time, is where is the line? 
How do you draw this line to know whether or not I can spend my money on this or on that? And the answer that I will give you is the answer that the Bible gives. And it doesn't give us one. There's no line. There's nothing in the Bible that says this is how much you can spend on shoes. This is how much you can spend on a house. This is how much you can spend on a purse. It doesn't give us that. Because the Bible is written to different cultures at different times. And we can't just have some universal line that we give for everybody. It's not going to work. So then what should be the line? You should determine where that line is for you. In other words, you cannot just live life and not know where the line is. Because what you'll do is you'll just say, well, because I have given something, that makes it okay. Again, he says that the line should be somewhere where you are thinking about other people more than you're thinking about yourself. If we take James seriously, we have to draw a line for ourselves. And here's a principle that you need to understand here. No Christian, no Christian should ever live as well as they could. It should always be a little bit less than that. And the reason I know that is because God says, I want you to give. That's why the tithe is there. Because he says, I don't want you to live on everything that you make. I want you to give some of it away. Can you imagine if God said, no more tithing, no more giving, you don't have to give to anything, keep everything. Can you imagine that's like tax day all over again. More money, more stuff to, to use on who? Myself. So no Christian should just live as well as they could. We should be thinking, how can I live and use the wealth God has given me for the sake of others? And people make this mistake to think, if I had more money, then I would be more generous. God hasn't given me a lot of money, therefore I'm not, I can't be as generous as that person. The average American family makes $50,000 a year, and it says that they give away 6% of their income to charity. So you would think if people make more, then they'll probably give more. But the percentages say, or the, the statistics, they tell us that the richer you get, the less you give. If you, have, if you make $200,000, you know what the number is? 4%. And the higher you get, the lower it goes. Don't think about amount. Think about percentage. Because for Bill Gates, to him to give $5,000 is nothing. Amen. For me to give $5,000 is a lot. So in percentage, if you say, if God gave me more, I would give more. You might give more in terms of dollars, but you might not give more in terms of percentage. And that's how you know where your heart really is. You know people, John Wesley, he at one point was making a certain amount, and as he got more and more and more famous in his hymns and his sermons, he started to make in the area of millions of dollars. And what he would do is he knew how much he needed to make in order to get by, and he stayed there. Even though he was making much more, he didn't use all that. He said, I know how much I need to live. I know how much I need to to get what I need, and I give all the rest of it away. Again, I can't tell you what to do. I I can't give you a line but you need to figure out where that line is for you. What have we given up to support the work of the church or missions or to care for poor Christians? And here's something that I think is really important to think not just what have I given, but what have I given up? Because what we'll say is, I've given, I have my savings, I have my, my tithes, I have my you know, bills, whatever, and then whatever is left, I get to use for myself. And that's true. But giving in the scriptures, I don't know if you've noticed this, that there are people who give sacrificially to the point where it hurts. And sometimes we say, we're so rich that we can give stuff away and it not even hurt us. I've tithed, I've given to this, and I have extra money left over, and we feel good because we've given, but what have you given up? Maybe it'd be good for our hearts to not go to Starbucks for a week. And use that money instead to give to whatever it is. Because we use it on ourselves. We're just, we're just fattening ourselves up for the day of, of slaughter. Did you see when he said that? you just eating and eating and eating and eating. Again, this is only if you are the unrighteous rich. Because you are fattening yourselves in the day of slaughter. It's two cows that are sitting out in front of a slaughterhouse and they're eating. They're like, man, our, our master is so good. He brings us so much food. Yes, he does. It's so, so good. Our master is good to us. It's really, really good. We're so blessed. Yes, we are. And they get, you're getting bit. 
You're getting really big. He's like, I know, because I've been eating, I've been eating. And they just eat, 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 not knowing they're just being fattened for the day of slaughter. He's saying, you rich people, you're eating, you're indulging, you're doing all this for yourself, and all you're going to do is fatten yourself up for the day when the Lord comes back. And again, this is so important because you and I, we are all rich. We have more than we need. And even if you're in here saying, I'm struggling, I'm, I have this, that, I have that bill, I can barely make rent, whatever it is, there are people in the world who would love to be in your position. Yeah. And even if you do struggle, you know there are people in the world, in your church, in your family who will help you. I praise God that I have people in my life, when I need something, they come alongside and help me. Some of you, in the, in the years where you've given, that's been such a blessing to me and my family. When we give to the pastor and wife on an anniversary, when we give a bag of groceries to people, this is the work of God to be generous to other people. Listen to this quote by Randy Alcorn. He says, God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. God gives us more money than we need so that we can give generously. The last part of that verse, he says, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. It's hard to know what he's talking about. And so there are two ideas that it could be. He could be talking about, because he's using it singularly, condemn the innocent one, like he's talking about one person. And in the world could you be talking about one person and you've been talking about defrauding the poor, which is a bunch of people. So it could be he's saying there's this one person who represents all people who are poor, who need assistance. And there's a book, it's a book of wisdom and literature, Sirach, and it's not, a, um, it's not a book that we look at that's part of our canon, part of our scriptures, but it does help to look at those things because it tells us the things that Jews in those days, how they thought about things, some of the thoughts that are going around. I don't have it on the screen, but listen to what it says about um, how we treat those who are poor. It says, bread is life to the destitute, and to deprive them of it is murder. To rob your neighbor of his livelihood is to kill him. And he who defrauds a worker of his wages sheds blood. So when he says you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you, these poor people that you're oppressing by not giving them their wages, by holding back all that you have and not giving to them, you're actually, you could be murdering them. And they're not opposing you. They're just saying, this is what it is. This is the life that I have. He says, because of this, the judgment of God is coming upon you. But another thought that I had, not just me, this has actually been around for a long time. If you look at it, who else do you know was condemned and murdered even though they were innocent and didn't oppose? It could be the Lord Jesus. In Isaiah 53 verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. As he was being on trial and being punched and kicked and his beard being ripped out, he did not retaliate. He was condemned. He was murdered. And it's interesting, you see in the book of Matthew, when at the end of the age, they're saying, when did we see you? Say, if you did it for the least of one of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Saul is going, he's punishing and throwing Christians in jail. And he appears to him and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? Me. Jesus is in heaven. How are you persecuting me? Because in the eyes of the Lord, to hurt his church is to hurt him. All sin is ultimately against God. And so why do we want to be people who use our wealth in a way that is honoring God, because when we do that, when we help the needy, when we use the resources and the wealth that we have to help people, it's like we're helping God himself. And when we do that, we are pleasing to the Lord. Question, if you knew Jesus was coming back at the end of this month, how would you live your life? I don't know any of you would go like, oh, I got to buy those shoes. <laughs> Especially knowing what you know about what God says about wealth. You would know immediately, I'm not buying no shoes. 
I'm going to do some stuff that could get me some rewards in heaven. But the, this whole text is an eschatological text because it's pointing to the coming of the Lord. We always should live our life thinking about the coming of the Lord. How do I use my wealth in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back? That never ends just because you think he's coming back tomorrow. Because all the stuff that you have now, it will be worth nothing in the age to come. Again, when we went to go to um, Chuck E. Cheese and Scandia, they used to have tokens. Scandia tokens, Chuck E. Cheese tokens. Can you imagine me saving all the tokens? And I come to Scandia today talking about, uh, I want to play games. You know what they would tell me? Uh, Those don't work here anymore. It's all digital now. You got to get a little card. You imagine trying to take all your stuff into the new heavens and new earth. Uh, That doesn't work here. It's nothing. This is why Jesus said, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There was a man named Maxi Jarman. He was a wealthy business owner and He made millions of dollars in his businesses, millions of dollars, but he also gave away millions of dollars to help start churches, to plant churches, and he gave away so much of his money. And so at the end of his life, through a series of events, he lost almost everything that he had done in his companies. He lost most of it and a lot of his personal stuff. And so someone said to him in the midst of it, they said, are you at all re- regretting the fact that you gave away so much money? So much. I mean, you gave away millions and millions and millions. And you know what he said? He said, you know, the reality is everything that I gave away, that's what I have. And everything that I kept, that's what I lost. I lost. 